This is Art in Camelot, a look at the arts in the Kennedy years. I'm Richard Dreyfus, and in this segment, we hear about music inside the Kennedy White House. Today, it's something we consider routine a big name celebrity concert broadcast from the White House. Give it up one more time for Mr. Stevie Wonder. Hello, we are the Foo Fighters. It's nice to see you. Happy 4th of July. As the First Lady and her daughters looked on, a great show went down. First up was Amber Riley from Glee. Sir Paul McCartney! Presidents have hosted entertainment at the White House for almost 200 years. But the idea of concerts that could be shared with the public, that started at a very specific time under a very specific president. Writers, directors, producers, singers have come from so many parts of the country to express their happy involvement and solidarity as Democrats and Americans. That's movie star Betty Davis speaking the night before John F. Kennedy was sworn in as president. There were two presidential galas that night, one with the National Symphony Orchestra and the second featuring some of the brightest stars of Broadway, music, and the movies, put together by the biggest pop star of all back then, singer Frank Sinatra. You make me feel so young. You make me feel there were songs to be sung. Miss Ella Fitzgerald. There songs of love. But not for me. Miss Ethel Merman. I had a dream. A dream about you, baby. It's It's Mr. John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Tonight, there are two shows on Broadway that are closed down because the members of the cast are here. The entertainment world flocked to Kennedy when he ran for president in 1960. And once he was elected, the president didn't disappoint. There were a flurry of performances at the White House that all happened in about a thousand days. Performers, ballet dancers, Shakespearean actors, opera singers. The American Ballet Theater, the Metropolitan Opera Studio, the Shakespeare Theater, the Jerome Robbins Ballet. There was a concert of Casals. There was a concert of Bunbury, Stone Stern Rose Trio. So many. The Boston Youth Symphony performed the Interlochen Arts Academy. And all these are represented in less than three years at the White House. President Kennedy made the arts a special cause. He was the first president-elect to have a poet read at the inauguration. He was the first to commission a composer to write a work for his swearing-in. He changed the way the U.S. government bought art, and he literally changed the shape of U.S. government architecture. Some of that happened behind the scenes. But the president and the first lady decided to shine a bright spotlight on the performing arts during their time in the White House. Elise Kirk is author of the book Music at the White House. I love Leonard Bernstein's comment. He said he cared about creativity. He had a wonderful respect for the creative mind, and the arts are included. More concerts, ballets, and operas were staged inside the White House for President and Mrs. Kennedy than ever had been before or ever have been since. They wanted to, and I say they because I'm, I put Mrs. Kennedy with him, make the White House a showcase for the performing arts in America. But you know what she said once? She said, I'm interested in bringing to the White House the best. Anything that happens at the White House is going to have a political tilt to it. There's no way to get around that. And the Kennedys didn't try. 
Elaine Rice Bachman is the author of Designing Camelot, a book about Mrs. Kennedy's love of the arts. She says it's important to remember the fact that they could bring attention to their own interests and their own causes and the causes of their administration through the arts. <laughs> Of the American singers who in recent years have begun to dominate the international musical scene, one of the most fascinating, vital and successful is Grace Bunbury. An important issue during the Kennedy years was equal rights for African Americans. Grace Bunbury was the most celebrated young African American opera singer at the time. She wasn't the first black opera singer to perform at the White House. Madame Marie Selika performed at the end of Rutherford B. Hayes' term of office in the 1880s. But Grace Bunbury's concert in 1962 was noted by the black press, which considered it very important. As Elise Kirk says, Here was a young singer. The Kennedys loved youth. And they gave her the opportunity to make her American debut in the White House. Grace Bunbury's performance was one of a series of concerts for young people that the Kennedys organized at the White House. This is the uh, first in a series of concerts here at the White House by younger people uh, for younger people. Youth symphonies from central Kentucky and from Massachusetts performed. So did a youth orchestra from North Carolina. There was a Mozart opera performed by the Young People's Division of the Metropolitan Opera and a concert of Debussy and Liszt by a 20-year-old Korean pianist. But the White House concert that made the biggest splash was held the night of November 13, 1961. Great Spanish cellist, Maestro Pablo Casals, was no stranger to the White House. He performed for Theodore Roosevelt in 1904. But as Elise Kirk points out, it had been years since he played a concert in the United States. He didn't perform in America anymore because he felt that the U.S. was recognizing the Franco administration. Madrid turns out its fullest pomp as Spain celebrates the resumption of normal diplomatic relations with the United States. New U.S. Ambassador to Spain, Stanton Griffiths, in a cortege of royal coaches and Moorish guards, rides to the National Palace to present his credentials to Generalissimo Francisco Franco. General Franco was the totalitarian dictator of Spain who came to power in 1939. During the Second World War, the United States and England had removed the fascists Hitler and Mussolini from power, but not Franco. According to Casal's widow, Marta Casal's Istomen, this was something the maestro just couldn't understand. He was very upset and very, very sad that this happened. And he said, why the countries who fought for this freedom and that they leave one dictator, which is in my country, Spain. Casals decided that, as punishment, he would never again play in England or the United States as long as they recognized Franco. But according to his wife, Casals had another conflicting opinion. He felt that music had to contribute to freedom, to peace, to good things. And when President Kennedy started running for office, the maestro, who was living in exile in Puerto Rico, thought he saw one of those good things about to happen. So he said, my goodness, this man, I I have to follow. So he wrote letters to Kennedy, which were answered by Kennedy. When he won the elections, again, another letter went and another letter was answered. And lo and behold, a few months later, actually, 
Ah, he was invited to the White House. The maestro, who was 85 years old, accepted the invitation. And according to Elise Kirk, the media went wild. The evening was really like magical. Again, Pablo Casal's widow, Marta Casal's Istomen. It was so beautifully said, and the people who were there, musicians, artists, uh, it was wonderful. It was not only important from the repertoire that Casals played, but also for the guest list. This was the first time, Elise Kirk says, that such a large group of American composers was ever gathered at the White House. Giancarlo Minotti, Aaron Copeland, uh, I could go on and on, Leonard Bernstein. I read later about what Leonard Bernstein said about that event. He said, never had he seen so many happy artists. comes out very straight at 85 years old and sat down and played the cello and there was you could hear a pin drop this silence at the end of the concert after the applause Casals walked over to the president Kennedy towered over the tiny maestro. So Mrs. Casals Estoman says, the president bent down while the famous cellist whispered in his ear. And he told him, Mr. President, I'm going to play for you the Song of the Birds, which is a song that I have adopted, signifying my nostalgia for my homeland. And it also represents my feelings and my hopes for freedom and peace. Afterwards, Mrs. Casals and her husband went upstairs for a private visit with the first couple. Finally, after, I don't know, half an hour or an hour, the president had to leave, and then people started leaving. But Mrs. Kennedy stayed. She went downstairs again with us to that room where the cello was, and she said, Oh, maestro, what music has come out of this because of you is something. Can I see the cello again? So I opened the case. She knelt on one knee and pressed her hand against the instrument. He said, thank you, maestro. Well, big emotion. And afterwards, we were ready, with coat and all that. And Mrs. Kennedy was there with no coat. It was November 13th. It was chilly out. She came all the way to the car and waved Maestro Casals away. You cannot have anything important in your life without music. The arts, music, painting, poetry, all these things are very important because they appeal not only to your mind but to your soul. And I'm so happy we're remembering it now because we have to remember all those things all over again. Thanks for listening. I'm Richard Dreyfus for Arts Edge, a program of the Education Department of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. <laughs>